Well, I'm excited to be in church. How about you? Glad to be here. Man. As, as I was looking forward to speaking today, I love any opportunity I get to speak. And so as I was preparing for today, um, you're actually getting a message that I wrote for a service I preached a few weeks ago. Um, but uh, normally I don't like to duplicate messages, but I just felt God's hand on it. And I felt as I was preparing for it and preparing for that Sunday um, with that church, I felt like God said, hey, I, I, want, I want you to give this to our people back at home, okay? So you're gonna get this message today. I'm super excited about it. And um, I know God's gonna move and I hope he speaks in your heart like he spoke in mine. Um, I know he's moving and he's stirring already in the room. I don't know, can you feel it this morning? Can you feel it this morning? Um, this, this passage and this, this topic that we're speaking on today has just been resonating within me for several weeks um, now. And so I'm super excited. And we're going to be looking at a very familiar passage today. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those passages that we, if you grew up in church, you probably learned about in Sunday school. It's very familiar. It's, it's what I like to call flannel graph familiar does anybody know what flannel graph is? We got, we got three people. I had to teach a lot of our staff members what flannel graph was, but Richie knew what it was. And so if you grew up in the Baptist church like I did, you had this little blue board in Sunday school that we put cool little characters on, you know, Jesus and his disciples. And if you were really cool, you had the bushes, you know, and the trees. You had the, the detail that went into the flannel graph. But today's passage is what I like to call flannel graph familiar. And I think a lot of times we think of these passages um, and we sometimes can overlook them and it, we, we just think of them as, as cool Bible stories that we talked about in Sunday school. And um, we, we just kind of skim over it because sometimes we take advantage and we uh, don't really uh, think in too detail about those things that are familiar to us. We, we can just take for granted those things that are familiar to us. And this is one of those passages that God has something that he wants to show us today, and I'm super excited about what he's going to do. Um, and today we're going to be in Daniel 6. I'll give you a few moments to kind of get there. If you have your Bible or if you have your smartphone, you can kind of go ahead and turn there. Daniel 6 is where we're going to be today. And not to give it away, but we're going to be talking about Daniel. Okay. And so Daniel chapter 6. And let me just do this while we're getting ready, while we're turning there, while we're, while we're getting ready. What is the first thing that comes to mind when you think of Daniel? All right. We're, we're on track. Okay, so we don't have to spend too much time kind of getting in tune. We're in tune. We're, yeah, when you think about Daniel, you think about the lion's den. Um, but before we get ahead of ourselves, I, I, there's something that I want us to see before Daniel gets to the lion's den. Before we get to that ever so familiar passage that where Daniel's in the, in the lion's den, I want us to look at what happened before Daniel got there. So we're going to be in Daniel 6. We're going to start reading in verse 1. And I know I might not make some friends here, but I want us to stand for the reading of God's Word. Can we do that this morning? Um, I love to stand in honor of God's Word just because I believe it's, it's living, it's active, it's moving, and I, I believe He's going to speak through it today. And so... Let's read here in Daniel 6. Words are on the screen, or if you're watching online, you can see it at the bottom of the screen. Daniel 6, verse 1 is where we're going to start reading. It says, It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Well, let's just pause there for a second. Just pause there for a second. The king saw something in Daniel. He saw something unique in Daniel. He saw something different in Daniel to the point that he had uh, had these three administrators over the other uh, leaders in the kingdom, and he decided, hey, I've got these three leaders, but Daniel's the first of them, and he was making plans to make him uh, the ruler and number one over them. And he was, he so distinguished himself. I love how scripture says that, he so distinguished himself, and I believe God's hand was on Daniel. 
because of his faithfulness. The, 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 the nation of Israel had been carried into exile. They were in a very um, bad place, but Daniel was still faithful to God. He was still serving God, and Daniel's faithfulness brought him favor. And when you're walking with the Lord, the world will take notice. And because of that, the king took notice And because of Daniel's faithfulness, it brought him favor. Let's keep reading in verse 4. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel and his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So here's Daniel. Here's Daniel. He's staying faithful. He's staying true. He's staying focused. He's he's staying on task. He's getting his work done. He's getting his work done well. He's getting his work done on time. He's meeting the deadlines. He's, He's overachieving, right? And the king takes notice, and because of his faithfulness, He got favor, but now his co-workers are taking notice, and they don't like it so much. And so not only did Daniel's faithfulness bring him favor, but now his favor is bringing him a fight. His faithfulness brought him favor, and now that favor is bringing him a fight. And there are some of you today, either here in the room, or either you're watching this online, or you're watching this later when you stream it on YouTube, and you've been in a fight. You've been in a fight. Sure, you're here today. You got your makeup done. You got your hair done. You picked out the right shirt to go with the nice shoes. You got in your car with your family. You drove to church. You look good on the outside, but on the inside, you're beat up, you're bloody, and you're bruised because you've been in a fight. And sometimes we find ourselves in a fight and a struggle not because God's turned his back on us. No, we're, we're staying faithful. We're staying true to, to God's calling on our life. But when you do that, the devil takes notice. And he'll pick a fight with you. Just like Daniel has a fight being picked with him with his coworkers. And so what I want to tell somebody today that if that's you, that if you're here and you're in the middle of the fight and you're beat up and you're broken, yeah, you might look good on the outside, but on the inside you're broken and you don't know if you're going to survive another day going through what you're going through, stay faithful in the fight. Stay faithful in the fight. Do what Daniel did. Stay faithful in the fight because the devil will do everything he can to drag you down and to get you out of God's purpose and calling for your life. Whether that's at your job, whether that's your marriage, whether that's your family, whatever it is, the devil will do everything he can to pull you down. And so not only did Daniel stay faithful and it brought him favor, but that favor brought him a fight. Let's keep reading. So these administrators, verse six, so these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, may King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed, not all of them, one was left out. Daniel wasn't a part of this secret meeting, but the rest of them were. They were conspiring against them. They all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any God or human being during the next 30 days except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. And here's our key verse for today. This is where we're going to set up camp. Verse 10, now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Let's read that verse again. This is where we're going to set up. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. I want to talk today on keep your windows open. Keep your windows open. Father, we come before you. We thank you for this opportunity we have to be in your house today. Whether we're here live in the room, are live online, are watching this later. 
God, would you have your will and your way through this moment? God, I yield to you my mouth, I yield to you my mind, I yield to you my heart, my hands, my feet, my everything is yours. God, would you speak through me? May these be your words, not my words. God, would you use me? And would we do our part to open our ears to hear and our hearts to receive what you have for us? For this is all for you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can take a seat. Tap your neighbor on the shoulder and say, are your windows open? Are your windows open? Keep your windows open. Oftentimes, like I said, we like to look at the end of this story, but notice we didn't read the end of the story, okay? We didn't read about Daniel in the lion's den. And I think we like to focus on that part of the story because we can relate to that part of the story. We can relate to Daniel and the lion's den because we all face lions. Now, I'm not talking about literal lions, okay? If you face literal lions, that's pretty cool. I'd love to hear the story. <laughs> Maybe we can get together sometime and you can tell me how you face the lions and you're here today and you didn't die, okay? And so we all face lions, and I'm not talking about literal lions. I'm talking about lions that look like pressure at work. You know, maybe it's, maybe it's a project you're working on and it's just hard to tame, right? And so we all face lions. Maybe lions in your life look like a struggling marriage. Maybe it looks like trouble with the kids. Maybe your lions look like a health condition that you just, you can't get a proper diagnosis for, you can't get healing for. Maybe it's a, a pain in your body and you're praying, God, would you take this away? And, and maybe you're here today and you're like, hey, is there an option where I can check all of those? Because I've got a den of lions, not just one lion, but I got two, three, four lions all lined up, ready to take me down. We all face lions. And maybe you're here today and you're like, hey, man, my marriage is good. My kids are good. My job is good. I won the lottery. I don't know, you know, if anybody here won the lottery, I'm sure we would know about it, hopefully, because you would tithe, you know. But maybe you're like, hey, life is good, but there's another lion, and he's called the devil, and the Bible says that he's like a roaring lion, lion seeking who he can devour. So maybe, maybe you're like, hey, none of those things relate to me. You can relate to that one because the devil's after all of us. If you're, if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, and we all face lions. And when we're in those times, when we find ourselves in those moments, in those dens of, of lions, excuse me, we, we want so desperately to find a way out, right? We want so desperately to pray to God for a way out, but God doesn't promise us a way out. But what he does promise us is a way through. And somebody needs to hear that today. Somebody needs to hear that today because you're praying, hey, God, would you take this away? God, would you remove me from this situation? God, would you remove this person from my situation? And God's saying, no, I'm not, I don't promise you a way out, but I will promise you a way through. And I believe the application for us today doesn't rest in what Daniel did in the lion's den, but what he did before the lion's den, before he even found himself in that situation, before he found himself in that scenario, the application rests there. And that's what we just read there in verse 10. So just to recap what's happening to Daniel. Daniel's working hard. He's, he's staying on task. He's staying faithful to God's calling on his life. He's being faithful where God has him, even though it's inconvenient. It's not his homeland. He's in a foreign country. Um, he's serving a foreign king, but he's still doing a good job, and he's staying faithful. And his co-workers don't like it, so his co-workers get together. They scheme to get him, you know, thrown out, to get him killed. Ultimately, that was their desire. And so here's Daniel and let's see how he responded. Let's go back to verse 10. Daniel 6, verse 10. This is our key verse. This is where I said we're going to camp out. So he gets the news that all these co-workers have come together. They've gotten the king to pass this decree that says that he can't pray to anyone else other than the king for 30 days. And that just wasn't going to fly. That's not how Daniel worked. 
And so let's see how he responded. It says, now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. The first thing I notice, the first thing I notice that Daniel does is that he goes home and he prays. Daniel knew to pray first, to pray first. So many times I think we, we turn to prayer as a last resort. You know, we, we sort of treat prayer like a fire extinguisher. You know, there's a fire going on and it's raging and we're running trying to find the fire extinguisher so we can put the fire out. And it's like, that's not what prayer is. Daniel knew that, hey, in the midst of opposition, in this circumstance, he knew to go home and to pray. But we get it backwards so many times. We will consult with doctors. Nothing wrong with doctors. We will uh, talk to friends. We'll uh, get on social media, you know. We'll get on, we get a bad, you know, diagnosis at the doctor. And the first thing we do is we get on our phone and we're on WebMD trying to figure out what's going on. And then when it's, we're all confused and frustrated and angry and lost, then we're like, hey, God, can you help me? And God's like, I've been here the whole time. Why are we just now talking about this? Daniel knew to pray first. And we have to learn to do the same thing. Jesus said this in Matthew 6, and we all know this verse, right? It says, but seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Here's Jesus talking about worry. He's talking about life. Hey, life's not always going to be easy. Life's not always going to go the way you planned it to go, but hey, don't worry. And if you want a little bit more detail, um, you know, preaching about this particular passage, we talked about it a few weeks ago when we were in our Here's Your Sign series. Pastor Richie led us through Stop the worry. And we talked about this passage. We walked through it, and you can find that video online if you need to get caught up or if you want to look at this in more detail. But Jesus is saying, hey, life's not always going to be easy. Life's not always going to go the way you plan. There's going to be, you know, roadblocks that you come across. There's going to be speed bumps that you come across. And don't worry. Put me first. Seek me first. Pray first. And stay faithful, and I'll take care of you. We'll deal with tomorrow. I love how that, that passage says, hey, you know, tomorrow has enough issue of its own. Let's worry about that when we get there. Let's deal with today. Let's deal with the immediate. I was, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day. We had lunch, and he's just going through it. He's got, he's got children that are sick. Um, they've, they've had some car accidents. They've had this, that, and the other. Things just keep, keep hitting them and hitting them and hitting them. And I'm like, man, how do you, how do you get through it? And he was like, I just have to take it one day at a time, because I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying. He says, lean into me. I'll give you enough that you need for today. And that keeps us dependent on Jesus in those seasons. We, we continue just to walk with him and talk with him, and he's with us. He's faithful. And so we need to stay faithful to, to pray first. That's the first thing Daniel does here when he's up against opposition, is he prays first. And the next thing I see he does is he has a prayer strategy. Not only does he pray first, but he also has a prayer strategy. And I kind of want to walk through this because this passage has a prayer strategy that we see Daniel put into play. And, and strategy is good, right? A, a good football team has a strategy, right? And they don't wait till they get on the field the next Saturday or the next Sunday or the next Friday to come up with the strategy. They don't wait till they're across the field from the other team to say, hey, let's huddle together, let's figure out what we're gonna do because that would be disastrous. They don't wait till then. No, they, they work on it. They, they come up with this strategy. If they play on Sunday, the, the next Monday morning, they're in, the, they're in the meeting room, they're watching the film, they're, they're dissecting what the enemy's gonna try to do and they come up with a strategy 
that they're gonna implement the next week and they work on it. They design plays, they drill those plays and they work on it because they know that the best way to take down the, the opposition is with a good strategy. And so Daniel has a strategy here to his prayer life. Let's, let's, look, let's look here in, in Daniel 6 verse 10. It says, now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home. Step one of his strategy, he had a place of prayer. Daniel had a place of prayer. Daniel went home. He got alone. He got quiet. He had a place to pray. And maybe you're here today and you're like, hey, you don't understand. I can't just go home whenever I think about it and pray. Please don't do that tomorrow at work. Please don't leave your job and go home and get fired and then come back here and complain that your church told you to go home and pray during the middle of the day and then blame us for getting fired. Okay, please don't do that. Please don't do that. But you have to be strategic and, you know, with, with, with how you do this. Maybe, maybe you have a break. Maybe on your lunch break, you spend some time in prayer. Maybe you pray first thing in the morning. Maybe you pray in the evening. You have to have a strategy for prayer. Maybe if you have an office, close the door. I have to do this. I have to do this from time to time. Whenever I am writing a message or there's been times where I just need to pray. You ever have those moments where you're just like, I just got, I just got to talk to God right now because life's crazy, you know? And, and, and I have to close the door. And, I, and the people I work with, they know if the door is closed, let's just wait, you know? Let's let him have his moment. Let's let him pray, okay? And so close the door, you know, maybe, maybe you pray in the car as you're driving. Whatever it is, find a place for five minutes or two minutes or whatever it is that you have time to do and find a place to get away and focus on God. And when we talk about focus, look, look, at, look at what Daniel found when he got home. and said he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. So he went home, he had a place to pray, but he had a place that helped him focus on God. Now, now, now for illustration purposes, we have, we have this window here, right? And I'm sure this is not what Daniel had, okay? We did not go and find this over in the, in the buried somewhere. This is not what Daniel had. This is very nice. I don't know what his looked like, but this is good, what we're going to use for today, okay? And so uh, Daniel um, went home, and it says that his windows were already opened. They were already open, probably because just a little while earlier, maybe he went home at lunch, you know? Maybe that morning he was already praying going into his day. Then he's at work, and he gets this news and then he goes home and he's praying again. His windows are open. Now, I'm sure Daniel had other windows in his house, okay? Um, it, it, and I don't know this for sure. We're going to pretend he does have other windows, okay, for, for our purposes. But he opened this one for a particular purpose. He was intentional with what windows he opened. This window helped him point towards Jerusalem and focus on God. It gave him, uh, you know, a fixed point to focus on when he prayed. And I'm sure he had other windows in his house, and he, but he, he used this one to open and to pray towards Jerusalem. And so let me just say this. Be careful what windows you leave open. Be careful what windows you leave open. And we, we live in a time, in an era, where there's a lot of windows in our life. We've got a lot of windows in our lives. These are a window. This is a window. Your phone, I got it right here, is a window. By the way, it's on Do Not Disturb, okay? And so we don't have to worry about that. We have a lot of windows. Be careful what windows you leave open. And just like my phone's on Do Not Disturb, sometimes we have to put our life on Do Not Disturb. And it's hard because we're inundated with, with emails and text messages and notifications 
and social media. Everything's just vying for our attention. We have dings and, and, and vibrations going off and phones are buzzing and you know uh, computers are dinging and it's just like constantly we've got somebody wanting to get a hold of us that sometimes we just don't have time to focus on God. But Daniel knew, Daniel knew he needed a place he needed a place that was quiet, that he could focus on God, and this window helped him focus his attention in a direction that, in a fixed point where he knew God's spirit dwelled. And so he had a place of prayer. The second thing is, is he had a pattern of prayer. He had a place of prayer, and he had a pattern of prayer. Look at this. It says he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem three times a day. He got down on his knees and prayed. Daniel prioritized prayer. He made it a spiritual discipline to take time to pray. And maybe you're here today and again, you're like, hey, I can't just go home and pray. Hey, my schedule's too busy. I don't have time. Hey, we all have the same amount of time. It's just how we prioritize it. It's just how we prioritize it. And so Daniel prioritized prayer. He made time to pray. And maybe you're like, hey, my, my life's so busy, I don't have time to pray. Maybe there's some things you need to cut out because prayer's important. Prayer's important. And we can find time to pray. We just have to be strategic with it. And, and, and maybe you're like, hey, my, my, my job or my family or my marriage, it's just, I, just don't, I just don't have time. I can't find the time. Daniel was very busy. He was a key leader in his empire it says that there were three people that had the same position as him, and, and of those three, he was number one. He was number one. The king favored him over all of them. He was busy. I'm sure he was, and he knew that the more, the more he got promoted, the higher he went, the more prayer that he required, okay? And so let, let, me, let, me, let me illustrate it this way. It doesn't just pertain to your job, okay? May, think about this. Think about this. When you're in high school, and some of you are in high school, you gotta pray. Prayer is good. And when you're a kid, prayer looks different then than when you're in high school. And then you're in high school and you graduate and you go to college. Maybe you go off and you're living in a dorm. You've moved out of your parents' house. You need more prayer. It takes more prayer. It takes more dedication. And then maybe say you graduate college, you get a, your job, you're starting your career. You need more prayer. And then say, hey, a lady friend comes along. Or hey, you know, a man comes along and you get married. It's gonna take more prayer, okay? Let me just tell you, and, and all, the, all, the, all the married people are nudging the one next to them. You know, when you get married, it takes more prayer. So as God gives you more, as he blesses your life, as he puts uh, more blessings into your life, it's gonna take more prayer. And then maybe you're married and then a kid comes along, right? It takes more prayer. Takes more prayer. Multiple kids come along. Takes more prayer. Daenerys is like, yes, so much prayer is needed. And so, um, you know, the, the more that God blesses you, the more that he promotes you, the more responsibility you get, the more prayer that is needed. And Daniel knew that. And I, I've experienced this in my own life. I started out in, in church. I, was, I, well, I grew up in church. Um, my dad was a pastor. I grew up in church. A lot of you know that. Um, but then when it came to like worship ministry, I started serving in the church just as a volunteer and then God grew me and I moved to a, another church and became a, an intern, kind of studying, preparing for full-time ministry. So I was an intern, you know, and then um, I did some kind of contract work. I got, got promoted into there and then I came part-time on, on a staff and then God gave me a little more responsibility and then I went full-time, you know, and then I moved from being a worship pastor to an executive level leader in our church, exec, executive level pastor in our church. And with each step, more prayer has been needed. More prayer has been required. And Daniel knew that. He knew these verses. Look at Psalm 55, 17. It says, evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. First Thessalonians 5, 17. This is everybody's favorite memory verse other than Jesus wept. Pray continually. If you're going to memorize a verse, there's an easy one, okay, to get started on your verse memorization. Pray Continually. It doesn't get more straightforward than that. And what Paul is doing is he's stating our message title for today in just a more no frill sort of way of saying, keep your windows open. Pray 
continually, pray constantly, stay in a state of prayer. And this sort of commitment, it takes dedication, it takes time, it takes discipline, but it's worth it. It's worth it. So Daniel, he had a place of prayer. He had a um, pattern of prayer and he had a posture of prayer. Let's look at this. This is the last piece of his strategy in Daniel 6, verse 10. It says, now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened. Three times a day, he got down on his knees. He got down on his knees. He prayed on his knees. And there is power in praying on your knees. There's power to praying on your knees. And I, this is a rhetorical question, but when's the last time you prayed on your knees. And I think the sad reality of that is, is you're like, hey, I don't really want anybody to know when the last time was that I prayed on my knees. Because usually when we're praying on our knees, we've been dragged down, we've been pushed down so far that we're just, we're forced to our knees. But that's not the only time we should pray on our knees. That's not the only time we should get down and just say, God, I'm surrendered to you. God, I give you this situation. I give you whatever it is that I'm, I'm walking through. Or just to worship and say, God, you're worthy. You're worthy of it all. Just like we just sang, worthy is your name. Jesus, when's the last time you just got on your knees and you just worshiped God for who he was? Not because you needed anything, but because he's worthy. Not because you're just in the thick of it, but because he's worthy. Daniel prayed on his knees and there's, there's, there's examples throughout the Bible. You know, if, as we read the scripture, we see people on their knees. Stephen, in, in the New Testament, he prayed on his knees as he was being stoned to death. As he was being martyred for his faith, he's praying on his knees. Paul prayed on his knees. Church leaders prayed on their knees. Jesus prayed on his knees. And I don't know about you, if Jesus is on his knees, I need to be on my knees. Because if Jesus is doing it, I should be doing it. If Jesus felt the need to get on his knees and surrender to his father, how much more do you and I? And, and the interesting thing is this, Daniel prayed on his knees not because he feared what was coming, but that's just what he did. That's just how he prayed. That was just his routine. That was just his pattern. That was just his posture. Look at the end of the verse. It says three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before, nothing shifted, nothing shifted in Daniel just because of this decree going out. Yeah, it was bad news, but he didn't panic. He didn't get angry. He didn't get frustrated. He just went home and he got down on his knees just as he had always done before. Didn't skip a beat. You know why? Because his window was open because his window was open. He, 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 didn't, he didn't panic. He didn't freak out. And so at no, at no point does he shift course. And I think that's important because to get to that point, to get to the point where we get met with that sort of opposition, where it feels like you're on an island all by yourself, all his coworkers were against him, you know, Everybody that he worked with was against him. It said that they all conspired and they went to the king. They left him out. I don't know where Daniel was, but he wasn't there. Maybe he was praying, <laughs> you know? Maybe he was at God. Maybe he was at home praying at that point. And they said, hey, let's go while he's praying because we can, we can uh, sneak behind his back and, and try, to, try to get him out that way. I don't know. But everybody he knew had conspired against him. Even the king who saw Daniel's potential, who saw what Daniel was capable of, the person that Daniel had so faithfully served and got his work done and done a good job to the point that the king was ready to elevate him to a, a more prominent role, even the king failed to reverse the decree that had been put out. Everyone was against Daniel, but he doesn't shift course, because his window was open, because his window was open. Let's look at this. Let's look at the end of the story here. 
Because all this sets the groundwork for where Daniel was headed. Daniel didn't know what was coming. He didn't know what was ahead of him. But he stayed faithful. He prayed first. He had a prayer strategy in place. And then the decree goes out. Let's look at this in verse 16. It's up on the screen. It says, so the king gave the order and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, may your God whom you serve continually rescue you. I love this because Daniel's faithfulness, his faith in God is now rubbing off on the king. But even, even with that, the king still issues the decree and he has to throw Daniel into the lion's den. May your God whom you serve continually rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. I love, I love the King James, it, it, it puts it this way, that his purpose would not change so that Daniel's purpose wouldn't change Daniel's situation might not be changed. There's a whole nother message here because God had a higher purpose for Daniel. He had a higher purpose for Daniel. Think about how differently the story would be if Daniel prayed, hey God, don't let me get thrown into the lion's den and then he doesn't get thrown into the lion's den. We wouldn't have that story. We, wouldn't have, we might not have any of this, but because of where this story led him, because of where this, this led him, the path that he was on, the, the direction that God allowed him to go through, the situation that God allowed him to go through, we have this story, we have this example. And remember, God doesn't always promise a way out, but he does promise a way through. And I love sometimes we quote, you know, Romans 8, 28, and, and we love that verse, when God works all things together for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose. And sometimes I think we think in our mind, that God's gonna work everything out and it's gonna be good. That's not what it says. That's not what it says. It says he works it out for the good. It's not always, it's not always what we would classify as good or as what we would classify as easy or comfortable. No, but God does turn it around and work it for our good to strengthen us and to make us into the men and the women of faith that he would have us transformed into. God doesn't always promise a way out because he wants to turn us into something more than we are. Look at this. Let's finish this story and then we'll wrap this thing up. Verse 18, it says, Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, may the king live forever. And look at what Daniel said. My God has sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me. Daniel's in the lion's den. God didn't remove him from that situation. He left him there so he could prove a point. God left him there so he could prove a point. And I'm sure Daniel spent that night in that lion's den. I'm sure he prayed. It doesn't say that he prayed. I'm just guessing that's because that's what he did. <laughs> His windows were open. He prayed. I'm sure he spent that night just talking to God. And because his window was open, we get, our, we get our third thing today, and that's that windows work two ways. Windows work two ways, in and out. And so if this, if this window is closed, we, we can't send and we can't receive. But when the window is open, it works two ways. Think of it like Chick-fil-A. You know, you go to Chick-fil-A and you pull up to the window, you give them money, they give you a Chick-fil-A sandwich. It's awesome. We love that. Windows work two ways, but that window's gotta be open. And Daniel's window was open, even in the darkness of that lion's den. When he was trapped in there, he probably thought he was gonna die. Anybody would think 
hey, I'm going to die. This is it. But because his window was open, God sent an angel not to remove him from the lion's den, but to close the mouth of the lion so he couldn't be hurt. Didn't remove him from the lion's den, but he shut the mouth of the lion. He gave him peace that surpasses all understanding. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where it just seems like you're in the lion's den and it's dark and it's scary and you can't see your hand in front of your face. You can't see the next step in front of you, but that's where God has you. And it's not necessarily maybe because you've done anything wrong. That's just how it works sometimes. We find ourselves in a lion's den. The question is, is when we're in those moments, is our window open to where we can pray and God sends an angel to give us peace in those seasons, to give us peace in those moments. Daniel's prayers went out and God's help came in. Daniel prayed and provision came in. It worked two ways. It worked both ways. And so the question for us today is, are your windows open? Are your windows open? And, and yeah, you might be in a season where you're like, hey, I'm in the lion's den right now. I just need to force this thing open. And that works. But, I, but what I love about this is Daniel in that moment, even though he couldn't see, because you remember when, when he gets to his house, his windows were open towards Jerusalem already. It was easy to focus on God in that moment because he could see the direction. He knew which way Jerusalem was. He could open that window and see the direction and focus and point his focus in a certain direction. But when he's in the lion's den and it's dark, who's to know which direction Jerusalem is? And sometimes we're in seasons like that where we're like, hey God, I don't, I don't know where you are. I can't see you. It seems like you're so far away. And it's hard to open your window and get in tune with him if they're not already open. And so the key for us today is get those windows open. Get those windows open. Learn the power of praying first. Get a prayer strategy together so you know you know, you're constantly in a state of prayer that you have a place of prayer, that you have a pattern of prayer, that you have a posture of prayer, that you're prepared. So when you do find yourself in those seasons, and you will, you will find yourselves in those moments where it seems like prayer is all you got, that your windows are open, that you're prepared. Just one last story from, from scripture. In Acts 16, it's a famous story of Paul and Silas. They're on a missionary journey. They've gone over to, to Macedonia and they're, they're ministering and they're trying to plant a new church there in that area. And the people in the community get upset because of some things that they've done. You can read the whole story in Acts 16. But they find themselves in prison. And scripture says that they put them in the, the innermost part of the prison, as far into the dungeon as they could get them to the point they probably didn't know if it was daylight or nighttime or what time it was. They put him in there. And it says at midnight, at midnight, they lifted up a praise. Now there's nothing in scripture that says, hey, at midnight, if you lift a praise, your, your shackles are gonna come off, the walls are gonna come down and God's gonna bring a deliverance. There's nothing in scripture that says that. Paul and Silas didn't praise for deliverance. They praised out of devotion. They didn't pray for deliverance because they weren't promised deliverance. Nah, they praised because their windows were open. And they said, even though I'm in this prison cell, even though I'm in this situation that I don't understand, even though I'm in this place that's uncomfortable, that God, you didn't, you didn't say that this was a part of the deal. He doesn't always tell us what's ahead. 
But even though they were there and they didn't understand it, their windows were open and they lifted a praise. And an earthquake came and the doors opened. But even if you read that story, they didn't leave because their purpose was still in that prison. And so can you praise in those moments? Are your windows open? Are your windows open? Because you don't know what's ahead. You don't know what's to come. Gotta have your windows open. And don't just, don't just pray because you need something. Don't treat God like a vending machine that when you get hungry or you need something, you just drop a prayer quarter in and expect to get something back. It's about a relationship. It's about talking to him. Crying with him, laughing with him. I've done all those things with God before. And maybe you're here today and you don't understand what that looks like and feels like and you're like, what are you talking about? You know, maybe you don't have a relationship with him. But you can. You can have a relationship with him. And it's awesome. And it's so rewarding. Keep your windows open. Keep your windows open. Let's bow. Maybe you're here today and you would say, hey, my, my windows aren't open. I'm not in a place where I've got a healthy prayer life. All those things that you talked about Daniel doing, I don't do that. Maybe today's the day you start. Maybe you tell God right now, hey God, I'm, I'm opening my windows. I'm opening my heart. I'm opening my life up to you. I want to have a relationship with you. I want to walk with you. I want to talk with you. I want to be close with you like I've never been close before. Maybe today's the day to course correct. Maybe you're here today and you're in the midst of a lion's den and it seems like all around you, you've got things just, just trying to devour you, just got you so buried deep, so pushed down. God's here and you can get that window open today and talk with him. Maybe you're here today and you don't have a relationship at all. You can make him the Lord of your life today. We would love to talk to you and lead you in a prayer. Pray something like this. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, dear Jesus, I come to you as a sinner in need of a savior. I believe you died to forgive my sins and rose again to give me life. Today, I receive that new life. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, just every eyes closed. If you can just raise your hand today, just raise your hand if you prayed that prayer today. If you're joining us online, you can click the button that says to raise my hand to, that you received Christ. We would love to get in contact with you. Everybody look this way. As we leave today, if you need prayer, if you would like to talk with someone, if you would like to, to, to spend time with someone, if there's something you're walking through that you need prayer, there's, there's Pastor Richie's here, I'm here. Find one of us, find one of our worship leaders. We're all around the room. We'd love to pray with you in any way that we can. Um, you, you have the, the Coral Colored Next Step card in your seat. If you could fill that out, any decision that was made, if you received Christ or if you would be like to, to be baptized next week, we're having baptism next week, or if you'd like to attend the Next Step class, any of those things, please check that and turn it in at Next Step Central as we leave today. But we're here for you. We love you. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.